Welcome back to Ridgeway University, the Baptist Faith and Message. In our first installment, we talked about the Bible. You can't really know anything about doctrine, or God, or how to be saved, anything like that, without knowing you can trust the Bible as God's inerrant, infallible word. Remember the article in the Baptist Faith and Message said, truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Now we're gonna move on to just God and we'll talk about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit later, but just God in general. That's where we've got to start. And I'm gonna read you the article. And by the way, if you don't have a copy of this Baptist Faith and Message workbook, that's okay. What you can do is you can either order it or you can call us at the church, 761-1110, and make an appointment to safely come by and acquire one of these workbooks. But let me tell you what's even easier than that. You won't have the workbook, but you can go online to sbc.net and or even our website, ridgewaybaptist.org, and you can access the articles of the Baptist Faith and Message. And so you'll have it there and you can refer to it. At least do that. But let me just read Article 2 God. Are you ready? There is one and only one living and true God. He is an intelligent, spiritual, and personal being. The creator, redeemer, preserver, and ruler of the universe. That's very important because some religions, not denominations, religions say that God is not personal. Some worldviews say that he's not personal. They'll say they believe in God or gods, but they don't believe you can ever know him, let alone know anything really about him. God is infinite in holiness and all other perfections. Infinite means he's not constrained. He's not limited. He's totally holy, unlimited in his holiness, in his love, in his majesty. God is all-powerful. The theological word for that is omnipotent. And all-knowing, the theological word for that is omniscient. He is not limited in his knowledge. There's, there's nothing that God can think of, discover. Uh, there's a funny phrase my pastor used to say, has it ever occurred to you that nothing's ever occurred to God? He, he's not going to have some epiphany. Um, sometimes the Bible describes him in human-like language, so that we can understand why he's doing certain things. But God knows everything, past, present, future. He is not limited by a physical body. He's spiritual. Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God is not limited by how we're limited in our flesh. And he's personal. You can know him. He relates to his people. Ezekiel 34, I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then they will know that I, the Lord, their God, am with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people. And he talks about that, and of course, through Jesus Christ, the Son, um, we've had a, a, a access to know God, and that's, of course, later in our study. Um, but think about this. God is self-existent. Um, he said to Moses, tell them I am has sent you. There's never a time where God will not cease to be. There was never a time when God was not. He had no beginning. He is the uncaused first cause of everything. And he is unchanging. Um, I do not change. Therefore, you're not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Um, he is complete. He doesn't need us. We need him. And there's some other things that we could talk about, but I think you're getting the idea. Let's talk about how he operates for a moment, the activity of God. Um, as, as evangelical Bible believers, Baptists believe that he created out of nothing the universe. Now, this is under attack in almost every arena by so-called Christians. And they believe that there was this pre-existing matter and God just took the chaos and brought order 
and even some Bible translations in Genesis 1, 1, uh, it says something like this, in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, but that's not what the Hebrew says. It's in beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. It, it, was, it was, after he created it, it was empty, but he created it out of nothing. That's called ex nihilo creation. But then, of course, you know sin came into the world, so he has to plan to redeem our world. He is our redeemer. He preserves everything. He's the preserver. Uh, it's been said no atom or molecule of matter is beyond his care and concern. He is ruler. Uh, that means he's, he's not like the deists say, a watchmaker, designer type. And then he builds in the natural law. There are natural laws, but he is sustaining and enforcing those natural laws. But they would say he just sort of did everything and stepped back. And that's contrary to what the Bible teaches about God. The Bible teaches that he is absolutely involved in his creation. Your hand to make great and to give strength to all. 1 Corinthians 29, 12. He is involved with us. Uh, now, I know probably you're thinking, what about the Trinity? Now, there's a great attack on the doctrine of the Trinity. Did you know from the very beginning, true Christians have believed in the Trinity? You can't knowingly, with full understanding, deny the Trinity and be saved. I'm not going to go into all that right now, but I will tell you, we can't totally comprehend the Trinity. The Bible never specifically and explicitly goes into detail explaining the Trinity, and the word Trinity is not found in the Scripture, and yet it's everywhere. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Who should I send? Who will go for us? Isaiah 6, 8. Plural. Not plural gods, but plural in Revelation. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Christian science followers, they all reject the doctrine of the Trinity. What you need to know is there are two ditches to stay away from, ditches of error. On one hand, in trying to understand the Trinity, well-meaning people have said, well, it's like this. God, uh, he sometimes is, is uh, revealing himself one way and then he's revealing himself another way. And in the sense that he's revealed himself in three different persons, that true, that's true. But they would say, well, no, there really aren't three different persons. It's just God sometimes shows up as the Father, sometimes the Son, sometimes the Spirit. That's called modalism. That's a early heresy um, and it's really what the uh, oneness Pentecostals teach it's what uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses not really what they teach they believe God actually the father actually created Jesus which is um, absolutely unfounded in the scripture uh, Colossians 1 John 1 so many uh, things say that Jesus was the agent of creation. He never was created himself. So they're not just modes, like uh, three masks worn by the same actor. And here's the other ditch. You're trying to understand the Trinity and you say, well, uh, there, it, we don't want to be in modalism, but maybe there are three gods. Uh, no, that one's extremely easy to... <laughs> debunk. I mean, the, the Shema, the Lord our God is one. Uh, and this is the absolute bedrock of uh, the whole understanding of the Ten Commandments and the Jews' understanding of, of, God, of their God. And um, that's why there was to be no graven image. Uh, there's nothing that can represent God physically like an idol. Um, and so the Trinity is something we uh, if we try to totally understand it, we'll lose our minds. If we try to deny it, we'll lose our soul, it's been said. But the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, but there's only one God. That's the safest, most accurate way to describe the Trinity. Um, I like what um, uh, 
uh, a man named uh, E.Y. Mullen said, the Bible does not explain the Trinity, it simply gives us the facts. The briefer the definition of the Trinity, the better for practical purposes. God is revealed to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These have personal qualities, yet God is one. This is the New Testament teaching. Beyond this, we tend toward speculation. And so that's very important. Paul the Apostle identified that God reveals himself in three per distinct persons in 2 Corinthians 13, 13. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And so I want you to do true or false with me. Are you ready? True or false? There can be no true Christianity without the doctrine of the Trinity. That's true. That's true. Um, the Bible does not explain the Trinity. That's true as well. God reveals himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's true. God is one God in three persons. That is true. We cannot fully comprehend the doctrine of the Trinity. That's true. The doctrine of the Trinity is not an essential doctrine of our faith. False. No analogy can adequately illustrate the Trinity. That's true. For example, H2O, water. It can take three forms, ice, liquid, uh, vapor, you know, so solid, liquid, and a vapor. Uh, but in, in essence, it, it's not all of those at, at once at the same time. It's, it's moving between those things, and God doesn't need to move between Father, Son, and Spirit. So one thing that our Baptist Faith and Message workbook affirms is that any analogy or uh, illustration of the Trinity really breaks down after a little bit closer examination. Um, by the way, some people say, well, God is just not wrathful like some people think he is. God is wrathful because he's loving. Let me ask you, if someone started hurting one of your children and you said, well, I just, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a loving person, so I can't harm them. Would you be loving? Would you really love your daughter or your son? No, you wouldn't. Your wrath would point to your deep love for your child. And God's wrath points to his deep love for us and for wanting the best for us. And he separates us from the world through um, his death on the cross and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We're to be holy as he is holy. Um, I want you to think about this, practically speaking. If you really believe in God, and I, I'm assuming you do, but let me take it a step far, farther. You believe in this God, the God of the Bible, that's omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. That's going to revolutionize your daily life. I mean, think about it. He's everywhere. He sees what you're doing. He knows everything. He knows what you're thinking. So how do you apply this in your home? Tell God that he's in charge of your home. You belong to him. In your work, do your work, the Bible says, as unto the Lord. So you're not working just for your boss. You're doing something because you know God and his providence, which is his rulership and his overruling in the affairs of men to accomplish his great purposes. He's put you where you are, and so you're to, you're to glorify him. Your social life, purity. Your church life, be real about assembling with God's people because God's worth it. Don't just say, oh yeah, I'm, you know, I worship God out when I'm hunting or fishing or on the golf course or at the lake. Well, I hope you do, but God didn't tell you to just do that. He's made it clear that you are to assemble and sing his praise with his people on his day. It's, this impacts everything, your private life, your use of your time, your use of money. He's the ruler. He's in charge. I hope and I trust that you understand enough about God to have a healthy reverence for him and to want to know him more. God bless you. Let me pray for you, Lord. 
Thank you we can know you. If it wasn't for your grace, we could not. God, help us to know you more and help us, Lord, to never um, look to other people and things to fulfill what only you can in our lives. In Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless.